Uh, so we, we're doing exactly that tonight. We're bringing uh, Faraz Abdul from Trinidad and Tobago here to talk about some of the birds and birding opportunities in that part of the world. Um, Faraz is, I know, a very mad keen birder, uh, probably even more so than myself, which is uh, saying something. And uh, he spends a lot of time looking at and photographing birds and he takes people on tours. He's also a, a published author and a, a well-known public speaker. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Faraz. We are one minute past seven and uh, we have 61 people in the room for us. That's not bad. Great, so hello everyone. And first of all, thank you. Thank you kindly for um, to Derek and the, the Learn the Birds team for um, hosting me here. And thank you to everyone else for coming. So let me um, first of all, try to share my screen and good. So we should be seeing you should be seeing my screen there and yep it's working fine fantastic and yes yeah, so welcome to this um, presentation on building the wildest islands of the caribbean and uh, i will try my very best to keep it within an hour because once i start to talk about birds i i very rarely stop unless i fall asleep which is also highly unlikely because I'm having a cup of coffee right now. So um, just a little bit bef um, before we get started on uh, who, who am I, I, as, as Derek was saying, brief introduction there, I personally don't like talking about myself, but what I will talk about is um, I'm half and half really a Buddha and a photographer. Um, so I would like to describe myself as someone who really sees the beauty in in all forms of life. So I tried to, um, to depict this through, through my images. Um, I enjoyed birds from, from very young age. And then I hope you're not hearing that in the background. Um, one of the hallmarks of living in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, yeah, so I, I always enjoyed birds and looking at birds and experiencing birds and uh, as I got older and got my hands on a camera, um, first of all, it was a film camera and I would try to take pictures of birds that were very, very poorly done. But anyway, I think I progressed quite a bit. So let's get right into it, shall we? Let's talk about Trinidad and Tobago and where we are. Now the title of this presentation is Building the Wildest Islands in the Caribbean. Uh, we can clearly see where Trinidad and Tobago is. Yes, this is a Caribbean right here. I hope everyone is seeing my laser pointer. Um, but what I want us to look at is um, this area of light blue here. This is the South American continental shelf. And what we are noticing is that Trinidad and Tobago is actually on the South American continental shelf. So there is a, a huge drop off into deep ocean right at the edge of Tobago. And uh, um, for, for the most part, we are very much South American in terms of our uh, flora and fauna as well. So it's like a, bit of, a little bit of South America with some Caribbean flavor. So if we look a little bit closer at Trinidad and Tobago, right? Um, if we start on Tobago here, which is a, a, a small island, we have a couple islets here, we, which we will end up on eventually. These are... Um, St. Giles, which is the northernmost um, land territory of Trinidad and Tobago, above 11 degrees north latitude. We have Little Tobago. And then on Trinidad, we have several islands off of the northeastern tip that we call the Bocas Islands. And down here, just off of the south, um, sorry, I said northeastern, I meant northwestern tip. Down here, um, across just off the map on the southwest here is a single island called Soldado Rock. Um, some other points to note here, um, we have three major mountainous areas on Trinidad and one on Tobago. We can see it um, by the little textures on the map here. On Tobago, it's called Main Ridge. And on Trinidad, our three mountain ranges are the Northern Range in the north, the Central Range in the middle, 
And guess what? The southern range bordering the southern part of the island. All right. And these mountain ranges, now I'm saying mountain ranges, but they're not really mountainous. Some of you may be very well accustomed with actual mountains. Um, these top up are just under 1,000 meters above sea level. Um, however, this um, the northern range and the main ridge in Tobago are the northernmost outcrops of the Andes mountain chain that passes through South America. But these mountain ranges interact with the prevailing winds, which usually come from the northeast, and that governs rainfall, which in turn governs the climate and the various habitats that we have throughout the islands. And what we would realize is that there are several very unique habitats, and I would like to call them microhabitats, that, uh, that make different areas on these two islands very distinct from one another. All right. Now, a little bit about our history. We separated from mainland South America just at the end of the last ice age, which is about 11 or 10,000 years ago. And obviously, by being part of the South American mainland, um, we had a lot of prehistoric megafauna that used to roam here. So megatherium or giant sloths or glyptodons as well. I think they found um, some years ago, there was an entire glyptodon skeleton that was unearthed. I can't remember the exact place. Uh, glyptodon is a giant prehistoric armadillo type creature. Um, during that time in prehistory, the hills were forested. So all of these areas were forested as they are today, but the lowlands, the low lying areas, right? All the way I'm passing my laser pointer, they were, they were savannas, right? And after the ice age, after the climate warmed and the sea levels rose, um, these, these savannas really became forest, so the, the climate and the humidity changed and started to lend to them being forested. And all of the savanna disappeared except for one savanna that persists to this day, and we will get to that point shortly. All right, and as I, I mentioned before about the rainfall, um, that unique rainfall distribution allows for many different kinds of habitats. All right, so generally the winds come from the northeast, so the northeast corner of Tobago, as well as the northeast corner of Trinidad, would tend to get uh, the most rainfall. And we would get less rainfall as we go west. All right. Um, so, yeah, so let's get to the birds. I know we're all here for the birds, right? Um, now, our islands of Trinidad and Tobago, we have so many birds that field guides i have one here right now right i don't know if i hope you all can see it right it's birds of the west indies and this is everything all of the birds of the west indies excluding birds found from trinidad and tobago because they these have uh, 429 species um, described in this book and if we were to add the birds that are found in trinidad and tobago well that book would be about twice the size right because as of December 30th, 2020, our official tally was at 490 species, right? And for um, a land territory that's just over 5,000 kilometers, square kilometers, that is, um, it is pretty impressive, right? It's uh, one of the highest species densities on the planet in terms of birds. In fact, it is the, the second highest uh, from what I recall. Um, so yeah, so more, more than 250 of these species breed on Trinidad and just about 100 of them breed on Tobago. Um, so this, uh, this is strictly, strictly breeding, which is tied to the availability of food. And that is also tied to the rainfall trends. So I forgot to mention that we have two main seasons in Trinidad and Tobago. One is the dry season and one is a wet season. And the onset of rainfall would, that would trigger certain trees to go into fruit. And then the trees going into fruit would then um, kickstart some uh, courtship and breeding activity for certain species of birds, depending on what they eat. Some, some species may be tied to, to fruiting trees, other species may be tied to insect blooms, and so on. So it varies. And um, furthermore, we have migratory birds that visit 
and some of them spend the some months here and others spend only a couple of days right so we have some some birds that pass through and some others that um that just stay for quite some time um in terms of migratory birds we have boreal or northern migrants and we have austral or southern migrants and we're special because we have we're an equatorial territory so this is why we would tend to get migrants from both the north and the south so what i'm saying is that at any time in the year we are uh, we we play home to some migratory species uh, furthermore we sometimes get some occasional wanderers from across the atlantic so they tend to give us a lot of a lot of excitement usually every year we would have one or two gray herons sometimes you get a little egret uh, we had a eurasian widgeon some years ago and from i think there was there, were, there was a rumor of a curlew sandpiper but i i didn't get to see it i went looking for it a few years ago but i didn't see it anyway so let's get into this virtual tour shall we and what I'm going to do is, I hope that everyone is still visualizing the map of Trinidad and Tobago. What we will do is that we'll start from a corner, we'll start from the southwest corner. And I, I really wish I could talk about every single bird, unfortunately, with 490 species, even if I spend one minute or half a minute on one, we will go ridiculously out um, of time. So. Um, we will start in the southwest and we will just uh, i'll show you some birds for each area and uh, maybe a couple of words on on one or two or the other all right and uh, yeah so my last point here which i forgot um, birds are generally evenly distributed across all habitats meaning that there is nowhere on these two islands that you can go and not see a bird or two so good um, let's get this on. Southwest Trinidad, that peninsula, right, uh, the lower left of the map, um, we have a lot of coconut plantations, extensive coconut plantations that are interspersed with wetlands. Here we're seeing a, a pair of great egrets uh, against a background of coconut trees. So there are a lot, a lot of coconut trees, very good for, for raptors as well. Uh, in the front here, we have some, in the foreground, some, some wetland vegetation. And uh, yeah, let's get into the birds. So here we have a male yellow hooded blackbird. And these are very common wetland residents across both Trinidad and Tobago. And they, they love to stand on uh, exposed perches like this and sing, especially from the crack of dawn. And this similar looking bird is a white headed marsh tyrant, which is actually a type of flycatcher, which I'm sure many of you may have guessed from the fact that it's got a little flying insect, a little dragonfly in its beak. Uh, these birds are found often in pairs as well. So male and females um, typically move together. Here we have our first raptor of the trip. This is a savannah hawk, a uh, very long legged raptor. And they, they prefer to hunt from uh, where you see it perched here on, on a mound, instead of let's say some other raptors like to soar and attack from the air. These guys love to pursue their prey on the ground. Uh, Black-bellied whistling ducks are perhaps the more the most uh, common species of waterfowl that we have across Trinidad and Tobago. They were formerly hunted um, quite regularly. Every year we have a hunting season, but uh, maybe I think uh, last two years ago, the the government outlawed the hunting of water birds and this the populations of these birds has um, responded quite positively to that change in legislation. Uh, final, finally here we have a Rufus crab hawk and this as its name implies dines almost exclusively on crabs. Uh, I could tell you a little story about this picture. This is the first time I had seen this species and I've been looking for it for years before and this bird was actually perched just above a sign that said crabs for sale. So maybe I should have um been looking for the signs i should have been reading the signs all along right good moving on um still in southwest in that um peninsula 
we have a, quite a few lagoons, some freshwater lagoons, and they interact very um, closely with the ocean, giving rise to a lot of brackish um, estuaries, etc. So um, a lot of birds uh, enjoy that specific type of habitat. Um, for example, we have a, a great egret here standing in front of a cocoi heron which is uh, generally a South American species of heron. It is one of the largest species of herons that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, about the same size as a great blue heron, but a little bulkier. Um, here we have an aplomado falcon, which is a bird that follows very closely the movements of migratory shorebirds because the shorebirds form uh, a big part of this bird's diet. So I'm talking about birds like this least sandpiper, which is the smallest shorebird in the world, and the colored plover, which is the smallest species of plover that we have visiting Trinidad and Tobago. Um, this, this little bird here on the right is a yellow chin spine tail. This is a resident bird and often described as a sound of the wetlands because they're always calling, they're always vocalizing. And if you look carefully, you can see this little yellow chin under its, under its lower mandible here. And its tail is, in, in fact, not a result of wear and tear, but it, it actually is spiny. So that's their, that's their trademark spine tail. We have three different species of spine tails here, and we'll talk about all three of them. And they all have these very characteristic tails. Now, the southern coast of Trinidad, um, just that lies in the direct path of the, the Orinoco River Delta. Right, so we get a lot, this coast gets a lot of um, debris that washes up out of the Orinoco. So we're talking about vegetation, we're talking about uh, these massive rafts of vegetation that would come, come ashore here, sometimes unfortunately litter as well. Um, but there have been um, some animals as well. So the things like snakes and lizards, sometimes terrestrial mammals like capybara. Um, there was even uh, a tapir that came across once. Uh, that I know of at least. Um, but yeah, so, but we're talking about birds, right? Um, here we have an osprey that's that's often found um, anywhere close to water. I'm sure many of us would be familiar with this bird. They have a, a pretty worldwide distribution. Um, they dine exclusively on fish. Um, one of the, the migrants we get here also is a northern water thrush. It's a species of warbler that, um, that, that they come down here every every uh, winter. Uh, here we have a hook-billed kite, which is a, a very unique and interesting bird of prey in that it, it, um, it eats almost exclusively snails. So they're found more into the forest, but the southwest is a very, very good place to see them. Uh, they, they kind of um, usually are perched, sometimes they're soaring like this, a very distinctive flight pattern. Here we have a spotted toady flycatcher, which um, I know the picture doesn't really give you a sense of scale, but if you can see my video, this bird stands at about around this tall. It's an extremely tiny bird, and their range is restricted to the southern part of Trinidad as well as in South America as well. Um, but they're very sedentary, and they can they can spend their entire lives just in a single copse of trees. To round up the set, we have a rufescent tiger heron, which is another special bird of the southwest. They really enjoy slow-moving rivers that are grown, that have grown over, um, and they got really bushy. So, very, very interesting bird. I wish I could have included the entire bird in the frame, but didn't lend to that. Now, format that is. Okay, so here we have a a view of the northern coastline of that southwest peninsula. So you can probably realize that the ocean here has a completely different character from the ocean of the southern peninsula, uh, of the southern coast, sorry. So this is the Gulf of Paria, a very sheltered, a very sheltered um, piece of, of water. And the shoreline um, speaks to that as well. Here we have um, a lot of almond and teak trees, and the fruits of these make very good um, preferential food then for species like this blue and yellow macaw. Um, on the shoreline, we can get a lot of, a lot of um, water birds, a lot of terns, a lot of gulls and herons. These are common terns and they can be found pretty regularly. And here we have a banana quid, which is probably, it's not unique to this particular area, but it is 
uh, likely the most abundant passerine on the islands of Trinidad and Tobago. I had to include it somewhere. And there's nowhere that you can go and not hear a banana quit twittering. I'm actually surprised I'm not hearing one twittering by the window right now. Uh, deep into the forest, you can find species like this a crimson crested woodpecker. Uh, this is the largest woodpecker we have in Trinidad and Tobago, and I believe the largest woodpecker in the Caribbean. And here we have a scaled dove. Scaled doves are interesting. Their story that is because they, they, they were found in Trinidad up until the 20s, the 1920s that is. So that's whoa, a whole hundred years ago. And then they were not seen up until maybe around 2010 or 20, somewhere between 2010 and 2012. And the local birder heard a strange call and upon his investigation found a pair of scaled doves. And since then they've established themselves in certain pockets in the country, but in the Southwest of the, of the island is the best place to get a glimpse of these wonderfully patterned uh, little doves. So moving a little north, but still in the Southwest Peninsula, we have uh, some more wetlands, uh, really extensive marsh, marshlands we have here, and they also have some scrub vegetation on them. So a nice mix of habitats. Um, if you look at the, at the dark green areas, all of this area here that I'm um, pointing at the, with the laser pointer, all of that is waterlogged. And these marshlands actually are the, it's really the best place if you would like to spot some of our most secretive birds. And I'm talking about um, bitterns specifically, right? So these wetlands are the best place to find all three species of bitterns in Trinidad and Tobago. Pictured here is a pinnated bittern, which is the, the, tall, the, the biggest one. We also have least and stripe backed. But this is how we, they've, they're usually seen with just their heads poking out of the reeds. And yeah, so finally we have a hummingbird. This is, I'm sure you all were waiting on this, right? Um, this is a white-tailed golden throat. And it is a, a, it, it specializes in open country. So areas of scrub and wetland. Um, these, these hummingbirds love this kind of habitat. They're very rarely found in forested areas. And although the throat here may not look quite golden, it can flash gold, pure gold, when, when it wants to. I think the frame after this frame, um, it pulled out of the flower and it looked at me and the entire throat was golden, but the picture was out of focus. So, say la vie. Here we have a masked yellow throat. This is a male and just as a male uh, yellow-hooded blackbird does, this bird loves to um, perch on exposed perches, especially first thing in the morning and belt his song for all the ladies to hear, right? This is one of our three species of resident warblers in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, actually in Trinidad, Tobago does not have any resident species of warblers, only Trinidad. Um, as, a, uh, as a different bird here, this is not a resident, this is a migrant. And this is a Dixisle, which is an eruptive visitor to Trinidad and Tobago. And by eruptive, I mean that some years they are here in a few numbers, some years there are none, and other years they're here in their droves. So um, sometimes tens of thousands in years gone past, maybe about 20, 30 years ago, we used to get about uh, 200,000 in a single flock. So as with everything, the numbers are decreasing. So I mean, I hope that we can reverse their fortunes. Um, here we have a purple gallinule, which is uh, might resemble some birds that you all are familiar with, like purple swamp hens and that. Um, but it's a very charismatic species and a head turner. Anywhere we go, this, this bird is a resident of wetlands in Trinidad, as well as on Tobago. Um, good. So we are finished with the southwest and we are moving on to central Trinidad. So here we have a... Uh, a picture of piece of the Caroni Swamp, and the Caroni Swamp is the second largest wetland in Trinidad, and a lot of the the mountainous areas in in the northern range as well as in the central range, they're drained by rivers that eventually end up here in the Caroni Swamp, that eventually goes out to the western coast. Now, why is this the Caroni Swamp so famous? Well, uh, let me introduce you to the Scarlet Ibis. This here is an immature bird. And this is also a singular bird. So if you think that this bird here 
is um, amazing. Imagine that this scarlet color is throughout the bird. So as it reaches adulthood, it's going to get completely scarlet and then multiply that by about 5,000. So we do sometimes, we do some, some counts in the Carony Swamp and we get between four to 6,000 scarlet ibis coming in to roost on a single island within that Carony Swamp. So I'll leave it up to you to imagine how it is. Um, but it's not all about colorful birds. Sometimes we have some really, uh, some, some brown. I mean, I think that this bird is also quite beautiful. This is a, a straight-billed wood creeper that is unique to the western half of Trinidad. Um, even though there may be mangrove habitats on the eastern half of, of the island, the western part is the only part of, the, of Trinidad where you can find this lovely little wood creeper, straight-billed wood creeper. Um, within the Carony Swamp, we can also get a chance of seeing secretive species such as this. Um, this is our boat build heron, and they love to remain hidden during the, during the heat of the day and come out at night. They're very well adapted to feeding at night. This guy is in his breeding plumage, so he's got some extra plumes, um, kind of like me right now. I probably am constantly in breeding plumage, right? Anyway. Um, this here is a masked cardinal, and this masked cardinal does not have any changes in his plumage. Once he reaches adulthood, it's the same resplendent guy as ever. Interestingly enough, the masked cardinal is not a cardinal, but a tanager. I know bird taxonomy is pretty strange. Um, here we have another hummingbird that is, that is particularly adapted to mangrove habitat. This is a green-throated mango. And they tend to stick to swampy areas, but sometimes in times of food scarcity, they would tend to migrate into the forest in search of food. Now, I said that the Karani Swamp empties out onto the western coast. This western coast is um, on the Gulf of Paria, and much of it is tidal mudflat, which really, really um, provides a lot of important habitat for countless species of birds. All right. Um, so here we have some American flamingos and in the background we have some snowy egrets, some little blue herons. These dots are some gulls, some terns. Um, uh, there's a, a brown pelican here as well. And for, for those of you who have extra sharp eyes, if you look at the around the feet of the flamingos, you would see some little sandpipers. These are western sandpipers. If you have successfully ID these birds, I would give you 1,000 theoretical points. Okay. Um, we have some lovely resident birds here all, all year round, like the black skimmer. Black skimmers are very unique in that their, their bills are shaped like this. They are very um, tactile in their hunting. And as a result of this, they can uh, feed during hours of near darkness. So they're actually very, very um, active during twilight hours when they don't need to see their food. Uh, very, very interesting and lovely birds. A lot of migratory birds like shorebirds such as this willet also um, spend a lot of time on these tidal mudflats. Uh, many of them present uh, some, uh, some identification challenges. As you can see, the brown on this willet um, is really designed to blend in perfectly with the brown on the mudflats, but when it flies, there is a very distinctive wing pattern that um, helps in its identification. Another bird that, that spends a lot of time here is um, a lesser black back, lesser black backed gull. I've been saying this word, this name for so long, I, um, I get tongue tied sometimes. We have the, the subspecies of lesser black backed gull here that has the, the, the lightest back. So ours don't really get um, that that black as some other um, subspecies do. Another migrant we have here is the black and white warbler. And this can be found um, pretty regularly in mangroves along this western coastline. Another bird that, that, um, that is found in the, in the mangroves is the gray cowled wood reel. And they give some really interesting vocalizations. So I suggest you, you search some of these vocalizations um, after this presentation and have a good laugh. Um, very, uh, I would say it's a cacophony, um, this, the vocalization of these birds. Now, away from the coast, we have a lot of scrub habitat. And as with many other parts in the world, 
Uh, the importance of this of the scrub habitat is often overlooked, but they have their own special cast of characters. Okay. Um, one of these is the gray seed eater, which is an excellent singer, right? It has a very melodious song. And it's it's pretty uncommon to see one here because many of them were, were trapped for, you know, people want to put them in cages for some really inexplicable reason. Um, here we have another bird that has that sings quite often and its vocalization is not as melodious as the gray seed eater. And that's a huge understatement. This is a, a pale breasted spine tail and I'm sure I didn't have to tell you to spine tail if you look at the tail it's uh, it has a very similar tail to the yellow chin spine tail that we spoke about earlier. Um, here, this is a, a greater Annie that also has a very distinctive vocalization. Um, this actually sounds very much like the great Caldwood reel that we just spoke about. Anyway, the greater Annie is a member of the cuckoo family. Um, and it has a lovely iridescent plumage that you can see under the right light. Coming up next, we have uh, the smallest dove in the world. This is a plain breasted ground dove um, by weight. I can't remember the exact weight of it, but it is very, very uh, tiny. And of course, we must have a raptor. And this here is a long winged harrier. As you can clearly see, it's got the wings so long. We've got, got them clipped in this frame. And this is actually making it's a way with an unfortunate ruddy ground dove, which is a more, one of the more common dove species that we get on Trinidad and Tobago. These harriers come in two main color morphs. This one here is a pale morph. There's a dark morph that is, um, well, yeah, obviously all dark, but they're um, always, always interesting to see. Now there are a few um, introduced habitats, so artificial habitats on the islands, and some of them are more prolific than others in terms of birds. And one of the more prolific ones are cocoa estates. And they are, I don't know if anyone has ever had chocolate from Trinidad and Tobago, but I can have, I have some, some very, very um, good recommendations. I'm very picky with coffee and I'm very picky with chocolate. And I can tell you that some of the best chocolate that I've had is was grown right here on these two islands. Now, why, they, why these places um, maintain such biodiversity? If you look here, uh, there's, a, there's a large tree here. The, the estates rely on shade and these large trees are for the most part left intact to provide this shade and they, they maintain that high level of biodiversity. Now within here, we can find birds like the black crested ant shrike. They, they are very, um, they're very common throughout different habitat, especially within the cocoa estates. We also get species like the plumbeus kite. Plumbeus kites are actually migrants from South America and very often they're here in, in quite large numbers as well. Um, one of our resident icterids is the crested oropandola, and they are very, very, very um, common throughout both both islands, and always, always a pleasure to see. Uh, this is another South American migrant. This is a fork-tailed flycatcher, and they're also here in great numbers as well. Their tail is very distinctive. Finally, rounding up this set, we have our first trogon of the trip. This is a Guyanan trogon, formerly known as a violaceous trogon. And if, you, if you're thinking that this bird resembles the quetzals of Central America, you would, you would be onto something because they are actually quite uh, closely related. Another of the introduced habitats um, are rice paddies. And these support a wide variety of, of species, especially migratory species uh, from both the north and the south. But where there is rice, there is mice. And where there is mice, well, I, I can't figure out how to rhyme something to do with barn owl than the, with, with, with the word mice. So I kind of um, drove myself up a dead end there. Anyway, this is a barn owl that is, I'm sure, very familiar uh, with many of you. Um, 
really lovely bird and they they um they are permanent residents in the rice fields as well as this guy which is a striped cuckoo and this is actually our only um, resident cuckoo species that is a brood parasite so now cuckoos are generally known to uh, as being brood parasites um, but this this is our only species of cuckoo that that performs this behavior and the species that usually targets are like uh, the pale breasted spine tail that we just uh, covered and they terrorize those little birds poor things but that's nature's way here we have a pair of stilt sandpipers. These are migrants from the north. Um, they come here along with a host of other uh, shorebirds. I would include a bunch of them here, but I would go on forever because I really love shorebirds. But anyway, where there are shorebirds, there are shorebird hunters, such as this peregrine falcon, the fastest animal on the planet. And they follow the shorebirds just like the aplomado falcons do as well. Uh, here we have a black-necked stilt which is one of our resident um, waders, right? This bird has very long legs. It's a, I think it's a, one of the biggest leg lengths, a body length ratio of birds in the world. Good. Um, I apologize if I'm going too quickly, but there are a lot of birds and I have a lot of talking to do about all these birds. Um, the rest of central Trinidad here is a lot of a lowland forest right um this picture was taken on the central range looking south so if you can look here on the horizon you're seeing some hills here this is a southern range and this extends or across the southern coastline right and within this habitat you would find a lot of different uh, forest residents um, such as this rufus broad pepper shrike um, it looks very much like the african bush shrikes yeah i'm sure some of you would be uh, making that connection. They occupy a similar niche uh, habitat. Um, this is a bird that's far more often heard than it is seen. All right, they have a very melodious call. Here we have a blue darkness. And this bird occupies um, forest habitat throughout Trinidad at all elevations, actually. They're usually found in male and female pairs as well. Another bird here is our only native species of toucan and Trinidad is actually the only island in the Caribbean with a native species of toucan and these are channel built toucans and they love to get on exposed branches like these and display especially during the dry season coming on to the end of the dry season and they would be calling loudly they'd be tossing their heads back and so on um, if you look carefully you would see that there is a second bird just underneath the first the top bird here and lovely lovely and very very um sought after here we have a red-eyed vireo this is the the resident race of red-eyed vireo sometimes called the chivy vireo uh, we have both resident as well as migratory species of red-eyed vireos sorry subspecies of red-eyed vireos here also um they, they tend to call incessantly, just like the pepper shrike, which they're closely related to. Here we have a short-tailed hawk, one of the many species of raptors that patrol these lowland forests, right? This one is on a nest with her little, little baby just uh, poking his head up there, All right? Um, this is a mother bird that's, I'll give you a backstory, it's screaming after the father bird to come. The baby has just woken up and the father bird did show up and uh, he showed up without any food, so he got a, a good scolding. Anyway, on to eastern Trinidad here. This is the Atlantic coastline, as you can see, is a lot of wind that constantly comes in. Remember, I was talking about the northeast trades that pummel the coastline, all right? The Atlantic Ocean always uh, feeds into the Nariva Swamp, which is the largest wetland on Trinidad, and um, creates a lot of brackish habitat here as well. Right within this Nariva swamp, you can find amazing birds like the Jabiru. The Jabiru is uh, a visitor here. They're not resident. They don't breed here. Um, they breed in South America. And sometimes we we're lucky to find a pair. They're usually found in pairs as well. Jabiru is made for life and are quite large. They're the tallest flying bird in the entire Western Hemisphere. First time I saw this bird, I thought it was a scarecrow because I couldn't believe that a bird could be that huge. 
Um, contrary to that, we have here an Azure Galenul, which is a resident, year-round resident of, um, of swampy habitat here. Um, but they're quite secretive and sometimes come out when your luck is on the right side. Further into the mangrove, we can find species like this American pygmy kingfisher, very, very tiny bird, as well as several other species of kingfisher. Here we have a crested caracara, which is a very, very resourceful bird and, oops, and a very, yeah, very resilient bird and their range is actually expanding. So they're adapting pretty well to human altered habitat as well. So I think a few months ago, a pair was spotted in Tobago for the very first time. So um, for my friends in Tobago, I expect to see more little caracaras coming up soon. Um, and the habitat there on the, on the eastern side is the open fields are also really good for uh, migratory shorebirds as well, like this American golden plover. Uh, they, they come in here and they enjoy the fields just as much as the caracaras do. Now, I mentioned um, when we just started that there was a lot of savanna on Trinidad and uh, that eventually disappeared into forest, uh, except for one, one spot. And that is the Aripo savanna, which is the only remaining part of that prehistoric habitat. So if you're ever lucky enough to visit this savanna, it's a wet savanna, the drainage is very poor. Um, but it is very, very prehistoric. So even the ground, you have very uh, a lot of unique plants that are growing there. I'm not that good at plants, but I can tell you that we have carnivorous plants there, like sundews. We have pitcher plants that are growing there, some lovely little ground orchids. And yeah, a lot of uh, unique habitat and unique, unique animals as well. So here we have a zone tail hawk that is patrolling. These, these areas, zone-tail hawks are actually patterned to resemble turkey vultures and they fly in very much the same way to trick their, play, their prey into uh, complacence. Um, here we have a boat-built flycatcher, uh, very similar to our great kiskadee, so keen birders among us would be able to pick out the differences. I will not go into that right now. Um, here we have a bat falcon as its name implies, it does eat bats and therefore is most active uh, during the twilight hours when, when the bats are flying around. Right During the day, they like to sit around on stumps like this and look around and just uh, hang out and enjoy the, the sights and sounds. Um, here this little bird is a trilling natren, um, formerly called a long-billed natren for its long bill. Its new name, trilling natren, is in reference to its vocalization. And here, finally, we have a white-bellied ant bird. And in the Aripo savannas, they are, they are quite common there. There is actually a little spot in the savanna that, that people call uh, ant bird junction. And there you've, you're more than likely to see more than a few of these white-bellied ant birds at that point. Now, within the Aripo savannas still, we have these little spots called palm marsh islands. And the palm marsh islands, they support these gigantic palm trees, which are Mauritius palms. And these Mauritius palms are very, very um, useful to a lot of different animals, a lot of different birds, as well as the indigenous peoples that used to populate here in, in great numbers in, in times gone by. Um, one of the species that we can expect to find here are red-bellied macaws, which are actually the, the smallest species of macaw that can be found in Trinidad and Tobago and they love to nest and feed in the marish palms as well. This is a sulfury flycatcher, which is also quite limited and restricted to habitat within, within marish uh, palm habitat as well. Uh, Aripo savannas is also home to all three species of our honey creepers. This here is a purple honey creeper, a very um, uh, full of personality and very, very um, endearing, I would say. And many people enjoy seeing these birds, no matter how common they are. Uh, just like the Rufus broad pepper shrike, this is a Rufus breasted wren that's also far more often heard than it is seen. But with patience, you are going to be able to get a good view, I, I, I promise you. This little brown hummingbird is a little hermit. Hermits are a subfamily of hummingbirds that they have very curved bills and it allows them to, to feed on, on flowers like these with curved corollas. 
and it's the smallest uh, hermit we have in Trinidad and Tobago. There are three. Uh, a little bit north of the savannas uh, is um, an area that's very fond, um, personally. Um, the, this is a repo livestock station. It's, a, it's an agricultural pasture. And every year I, I carry a group there to do our Christmas bird count. And we, well, I'm trying to get 100 species in a day or a half day. So far, I think I've gotten to 93 or 95. I uh, can't remember, that's the last time I did one there. Anyway, species that we can find here pretty regularly are red-breasted meadowlarks. And uh, the, here we have a, a ruddy-breasted seed eater, which is a, a tiny seed eater, also known for its brilliant, brilliantly melodious song, right? Um, here we have a grassland yellow finch, which is restricted to areas that are just on the, on the outskirts of the Aripo savannas. This is the only place on the island where we can see these little birds. Uh, a lot of tanagers also pass through um, the forested areas here, like, such as this. this. This is a silver beaked tanager and roaming the, the pastures and fields everywhere are uh, southern lapwings. They are our uh, one of our resident plover species and they can get quite aggressive when they are defending their, their nests. Anyway, let's um, take a quick trip to Northwest Trinidad. Remember I mentioned that some of these places are drier than the East because of the, the, rain, the, the rainfall level that's governed by the winds and the, the forest, the elevation, sorry. Um, here in the Northwest, we have a lot of bamboo forest as well um, that has been taking over. Bamboo, of course, is invasive. Uh, some of the species that we can find here are common black hawks, um, pretty regular. Uh, rufous tail jacamas, they occur throughout forest around Trinidad and Tobago as well. Um, but there's one of the best places to see them. We have several owl species here. This is a tropical screech owl, a small owl relatively, um, we're pretty common there. This is another um, species of resident warbler. This is a golden crowned warbler. Uh, they love the dry forest as well. Um, and this here on the, on the right is a green-backed trogon. This is our largest species of trogon and pretty easy to see in these parts as well. Uh, moving further west uh, on the Bocas Islands, right? So this here was taken on, on Shakashakari Island, which is the, the, the westernmost island. Just beyond here, just about six kilometers, it's the tip of Venezuela. And on this island, we can there's, there's a lot of scrubby habitat as well as um, a good bit of succulent vegetation because these islands are very dry. So some of the species that we can find here is our third resident warbler, tropical perula. Um, we also have white fringed ant wrens here that are pretty um, common. These are actually not found on mainland Trinidad, um, but they're relatively common on these islands. Um, they're also common on Tobago, which brings me to another point that um, these islands, the Bocas Islands, are geologically um, closer related to Tobago than they are to Trinidad. So that's a, an interesting little point to note. Here we have a northern scrub flycatcher which specializes in scrub habitat. Uh, the bicolored cornbill. Um, these guys are, are, are decreasing in population as well. They're on the red list. And another bird that's found on Trinidad, but not on mainland, on, sorry, another bird that's found on Tobago, but not on mainland Trinidad but on these Bocas Islands is the black-faced grass squid. And on to Northeast Trinidad here. Um, this, is the, this is a Grand River or big river, the translation. And uh, these are heavily forested river, rivers. You would not find mangrove, mangroves here, right? You just find forest and some excellent habitat for some lovely forest birds, such as this white hawk, beautiful bird as well as what many people come to Gran Rivera for, uh, a view of this Trinidad piping guan, which is one of our endemic species, and it is critically endangered. I think the population estimates are around 300 birds left in the world, and all of them are in the northeastern corner of Trinidad. Uh, of course, you can also find a lot of the common forest species, like this white bearded mannequin, and the swallowtailed kites as well. Um, some of Sometimes you can get uh, swallowtail kites in great number on this um, on these parts 
And here we also have our lovely uh, ferruginous pygmy owl. And this, I love to call this bird a tiny terror because it drives all of the other little birds into a frenzy whenever it appears. Um, higher up, in, as we increase in elevation, we can get a very, very lush rainforest. And at the highest elevations, we get cloud forest as well. And um, in this kind of rainforest, you can find very uh, colorful birds like the bay-headed tanager. Um, there are some species that are specific to the higher um, elevations like sooty grass squid and even scale pigeons. Scale pigeons can sometimes be found in lowland forest as well, but they are very conspicuous. Um, they, they tend to stick to more um, hilly areas usually. Speckled tanagers, on the other hand, they are rarely found uh, below 600 meters. So it's a really special and a highly sought after bird um, many visitors have. And of course, what would the rainforest be without an apex predator? Here we have a black hawk eagle, which is the largest predatory bird that can be found on Trinidad and Tobago. And it is a very uh, imposing and powerful bird of prey. Um, anyway, uh, moving on, there's a lot of um, tropical rainforest cover here, a mature tropical rainforest that covers most of the northern range, especially as we get um, into the east. Uh, we can have lovely birds like this broad-winged hawk. Broad-winged hawks on Trinidad are migratory. On Tobago, there is a sedentary population of them, uh, but on Trinidad, they are migratory. Our resident, the largest owl actually is a spectacled Owl. This is a, a young one that we can see here, and they are really, really um, charismatic birds. Um, violaceous euphonias are pretty common throughout forested areas on Trinidad and Tobago, but are excessively common in the northern range. Um, this is a chestnut woodpecker. Chestnut woodpeckers are more or less limited to areas of mature forest. And my personal opinion is that they are the most beautiful woodpecker that can be found um, on these islands. Um, and here we have a bearded bellbird, which is one of the loudest birds on the planet. The vocalization of this bird can be heard from miles away. And even though I'm sure we can all uh, Google what it sounds like, to actually hear one in person is something I highly, highly recommend. Uh, still in Northeast Trinidad, there is a special road called the Arima Blanchishares Road, and this road bisects the Northern Range at all elevations. It's like our uh, version of uh, Panama's famous pipeline road, right? Um, it is one of the best roads of birding on the, on the island, and species that are regularly found here include Great Ant Shrike. We get uh, blue-headed parrots here quite often. Uh, if you're lucky, you can get a summer tanager or two. These are migratory. Um, but you can all definitely find birds like golden-headed mannequins. They are very common and they are here all year around. So too are uh, black-faced ant thrushes, right? This is a pair here, but they don't like to, they don't like to fly at all. They, they prefer to call and um, drive you nuts by trying to locate them as they just walk silently on the forest floor. I'm sure many of us would be well acquainted with them. So here we have our first taste of what we would think of as Caribbean, right? Uh, lovely Azure Ocean. This is a Caribbean Sea. This is the north coast of Trinidad. And uh, we get a lot of this type of littoral vegetation, which is um, heavily adapted for sea spray. A lot of thick leaves and these kinds of plants, sea grapes and these kinds of things. Um, some species that we can find here are common ground doves, which ironically are uncommon in Trinidad. Um, and we have lilac-tailed parrotlets as well. So you can have also a closer view of those lovely little leaves. Um, they're very thick and hardy and are built for constant wind. Um, often perched in exposed places, uh, you can find a, a gray line hawk or two. These were formerly called gray hawk, but there was a, a, a separation in species. They're now known as gray line hawks. And of course, a, our copper rumped hummingbird, which is widespread across the islands. However, um, very rare to see this in any other part of the world. Another common bird is a squirrel cuckoo that got its name actually from a squirrel, right? Um, in, in terms of how it moves al along the branches. Anyway, 
Um, on to Tobago now, so we're doing an island hopping, right? And the, the southwest of Tobago contains only mangrove forests that are found on the island, right? And these mangroves are, and, and swampy areas are home to species like least grebe, which is a, one of the smallest grebes in the world. And we get migrants such as a yellow warbler. This is a male in the mangrove, of course. And we have a regal looking great blue heron. Um, we also have a lot of ducks that come here that visit. Uh, the white-cheeked pintail is one of our residents, uh, resident duck species. Always a pleasure to see, as well as several other species of herons um, used here as a very important breeding, breeding ground. So this is a yellow-crowned night heron. Uh, we also have black-crowned night herons as well, tricolored herons, little blues, and all of these other birds. All right. Um, Southwest Tobago also has a lot of scrub habitat, right? Even where there's water, there's a lot of scrub vegetation. So these kinds of trees, uh, they host a lot of different habit, a lot of different birds, right? Such as this bird, Anshrike, um, usually found in pairs. And this bird, which very much resembles a bird, Anshrike. I remember the first time I saw this, I, I caught a glimpse on Tobago and I was, uh, I thought it was a bad antrike, and then I saw the red on the head, and I was wondering, whoa, is this bad antrike bleeding from the head? But turned out to be a red-crowned woodpecker. Common across Tobago, but not found on Trinidad. So too is this little bird here. This is a scrub greenlet. This is actually the subspecies of scrub greenlet is endemic to Tobago. So it may be elevated to state of status of species sometime soon. Um, and it may be called the Tobago greenlet. So fingers crossed that it, this happens and Tobago gets its very own endemic bird. Um, migrants also pass through here like this yellow-billed cuckoo and as well as resident species of flycatcher such as this beautiful brown-crested flycatcher. Of course, I could have stocked this presentation with a lot of different flycatchers, but I, was, uh, I decided to be kind to you all. Anyway, central Tobago, there is a main ridge, right? And this main ridge forest reserve is actually the oldest legally protected tropical rainforest in the world. It's been protected since 1776. And the reason being is for its um, contribution to um, the local weather, right? Because it, it controls the rainfall, it's a watershed, etc. Home in the main ridge rainforest is one of my favorite birds, which is the blueback mannequin, right? We can also find uh, impressive raptors like this great black hawk, um, as well as a common potu, which uh, very often can be mistaken for a dead branch, right? Um, here we have our third species of spine tail, which is a striped breasted spine tail. Uh, it's pretty common throughout forests on Tobago, as well as on Trinidad. Um, so too is the golden olive woodpecker yeah um really really a lovely little bird further into the rainforest right now there are a lot of palm trees that you'll be seeing here which is strange for a rainforest right but this happened because in 1963 there was a hurricane that passed over tobago that was hurricane flora and it obliterated almost um, the entire rainforest here so there was a lot of opportunity for new growth coming out of that um, hurricane in that recovery stage uh, that paved the way for a lot of species of palms to take root. So anyway, within this um, rainforest, we can have uh, the chance of sighting one of these lovely little birds. This is a white throated spadebill, a tiny flycatcher, one of our smallest birds, as well as a white tailed sabre wing. White-tailed sable wings are unique to Main Ridge, and they were actually not seen for 11 years after that hurricane. So they were rediscovered in 1974, and they have been increasing in population ever since. Here we have a red-legged honeycreeper sporting his trademark red legs, and the only species of honeycreeper that can be found on Tobago. And here we have a colored trogon, which is another very sought-after species for obvious reasons. Sometimes a lot of people like to, to look for this bird around Christmas time. And um, it is the only species of trogon that can be found on Tobago. It's also found in Trinidad, but only on the highest slopes. Uh, another bird that's unique to Tobago is this tiny little olivaceous wood creeper, right? So uh, as it, it climbs the trunks of trees, it tends to look like a little mouse. 
Uh, I think that's by design. Uh, very, it's our smallest wood creeper. Uh, moving on to northeast Tobago, here we're looking north, right, uh, from one of the highest points on northeast Tobago. These islands here are the islands of St. Giles. I spoke about them when we were looking at the map. Uh, we'll get to them shortly, right? Um, and a lot of seasonal forest that dominates the land across here. And within this forest, we can find species that are like the Trinidad Motmot, which is another one of our endemic species here. And the strangely, it is a lot more visible on Tobago than it is on Trinidad. So I think that they should have probably named it the Tobago Motmot, but um, it is a Trinidad Motmot still. Here we have another very common and gregarious bird, the Rufus vented Shashalaka, uh, locally known as a Kokriko. Now both Kokriko and um, Shashalaka are in reference to the bird's vocalizations, which if any of you all have ever been to Tobago, you'd be very well acquainted with. Uh, here we have a roof, uh, sorry, uh, a ruby topaz hummingbird, um, which, which uh, can appear very, very dull and very, very brilliant in a split second, right? Um, just as a golden throat can do, as we spoke about earlier. Um, this is our resident and very common species of parrot, orange winged parrot. And um, this can be found throughout forests on Trinidad as well as on Tobago. Here we have a special uh, Tobago resident. It's also found on the Bocas Islands. This is a Fuscus flycatcher. And some people say this little bird looks sad all the time. I just think it looks kind of cute. Um, but all birds are appealing to me. Anyway, moving, moving on, Northeast Tobago. We have little Tobago here, which is uh, quite rocky. Uh, similar habitat to those on the Bocas Islands. A lot of succulents, a lot of cacti here as well, right? They don't retain much water and only plants that are suitably adapted to this climate can, um, can proliferate here. So if you look on the horizon, these rocks here, I told you these are St. Giles. Uh, we're getting to them shortly, right? Um, beyond that, of course, is the mighty Atlantic Ocean. Our little Tobago is well known for nesting red-billed tropic birds as well as multiple species of terns, such as sooty terns. And we have brown boobies nesting as well. Uh, of course, we have some passerines like the blueberry tanager. Um, if you've ever been to Tobago, uh, as well as Trinidad, you would notice that the, the tanagers, the blueberry tanagers in particular on Tobago seem a little more, a bit more vivid than those on Trinidad. That is no trick of the eye but uh, a result of the fact that this is uh, another endemic subspecies of blue tanager to Tobago. Um, another little bird that you can uh, keep an eye out for in little Tobago is the smallest niger that we have on Trinidad and Tobago. This is a white-tailed niger, right? A very, very uh, tiny niger. Uh, they are active, of course, at night. Now, finally, we're on to St. Giles. These are some of the wildest islands that I've ever personally come across. Uh, they are officially protected and access to them is strictly prohibited because of their significance as uh, seabird nesting um, sites. So a couple of species that can be found here nesting are bridal terns. So they're very similar to sooty terns um, as I spoke about just now, um, but they are a little less common and they can be found um, they tend to stick to the islands of St. Giles and are common to Little Tobago that much. Uh, we also have birds like brown noddies, as well as our red-footed boobies. Red-footed boobies are the smallest boobies in the world, and they have, uh, they come in, uh, we have them in three different um, color morphs or phases. This one is a white morph, which is the, um, the least common here in Tobago. Uh, we also get the brown morph, so it's completely chocolate brown, and we also get a brown morph with a white tail. So interesting. They look different, but they're all the same species. Now these seabirds all have to be very mindful of the presence of magnificent frigate birds. They are the pirates of the ocean, the true pirates of the Caribbean, as it would. Um, they, they love to harass the, the, the seabirds uh, as they come back in with their, with their mouths and crops full of fish. Um, another bird that you actually unlikely, um, unexpected find here is a scaly-nipped pigeon. 
there was a, a huge hurricane in 2004 that devastated the Caribbean hurricane Ivan. And since then, uh, scaly pigeons have colonized the islands of St. Giles and they have spread to Little Tobago. And a few years ago, uh, we actually saw them on mainland Tobago. So their range is expanding. And now we've been to St. Giles. We started off at the southwestern tip of Trinidad and we've traveled northeast. And we are, all that's left is the wide open ocean, right? Remember, this is the a, a big oceanic drop off. Um, this is deep water. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And we, the, the fishing is excellent here. So a lot of the seabirds, um, here we have three magnificent frigate birds that they are actually hovering above a bait ball. So there was a lot of action happening beneath the surface. And above here, there is a, a, the white-tailed morph of the red-footed booby. I don't know, I hope you all can make that out from the picture. And uh, down here, we have a brown noddy. All right. So I know after this year, we're finishing up in just over an hour, um, almost finished, right? We, I know you all are thinking, when is the best time to visit? I know no one is thinking about if they should visit. I know you're all thinking about when, right? Um, because these are amazing birds. Fortunately, most of these birds are, are, are visible all year round. Um, here we have a, a, a juvenile gray-headed kite, right? Um, I don't have the name here, but I'm gonna take my word for it. But there are certain species that you would have to think about in terms of uh, visiting, all right? Um, first, uh, if you're interested in breeding seabirds, we're looking at between January to May, the tropic birds tend to come at the beginning of that um, window and the terns would tend to come after, all right? Uh, we also have uh, boreal migrants between August to March, like this uh, buff-breasted sandpiper. These birds actually go down straight down from the Arctic onto Patagonia in Argentina. So they don't spend a lot of time here, maybe a, few, a couple of weeks at most, but some uh, boreal migrants stay all year round. Austral migrants such as this swallow tanager come up uh, to Trinidad for a few months between April and September. Interestingly enough, swallow tanagers breed here. So they, they migrate to Trinidad to, to breed. Um, of course, they are high elevation species as well. Um, there are certain uh, times, a uh, few weeks in early May and late July when both uh, austral and boreal migrants may be present. All right, um, so here we have uh, a flock of shorebirds that they are now getting ready to migrate north. And on the bottom right, we have a few large bill tunes and they've come up from South America, as well as all of the resident species of waders here. All right. So now there are a couple of things that we have to consider when we're planning a trip here. And uh, that's inter-island transportation. There are a couple of ways of, uh, there's a, a, a ferry that goes between both islands as well as regular flights. Intra-island there, even though the islands are small, uh, commutes take a pretty long time because the, of the, um, it's, it's pretty um, dense uh, in the population. So um, it can take about five hours to drive from one end of Trinidad to the other. Um, there are a lot of birding lodges that are, that are around, and some of them are now starting up. Um, a lot of uh, guides, if you're interested in coming here, I highly recommend a guide um, to help you see some of these birds well. All right, um, safety and your comfort should be a high priority. Uh, Trinidad has four species of venomous snakes. Um, Tobago has none. Um, there's a, a, a level of crime here as well. So it's recommended that if you are going to bird, that you do so in a group or with a guide at the very least. Also, we are tropical islands. So think about your heat as well as your UV exposure. So your sunscreen, your wide brimmed hats, uh, etc. Of course, uh, insect repellent is also a must. All right. Now, I before I, I did this presentation, I just asked my Instagram family if they had any questions. And some of the questions were how many species we have. So we covered that 490 species. Uh, when is the best time to see tropic birds, which is uh, between January to, to March to April. And another very difficult question was how to spot um, cryptically plumaged birds. And that would 
I would just answer and say that you need a good slice of luck, uh, knowledge of the habitat as well. Uh, for those of y'all who are letting your eyes roam around this frame, I don't know if y'all have spotted it, but there is one of our largest raptors in this picture. It's an ornate hawk eagle, and it is right here if y'all are seeing my laser pointer. All right. And with that, I would like to thank you and, and join me here. But before I actually, before I end, right, I would like to first say that uh, if you enjoyed my pictures, I am going to be offering a masterclass on Learn the Birds here. You can go to the website and get more information on that. And it's about mastering light in, uh, for wild bird photography. And I'd also like to credit Joanne Hussein, my um, ever-present wife, for making a lot of these uh, magnificent landscape images here that you see throughout this presentation. Um, so yeah, so so join me. Take a little cool dip in a in a in a mountain stream, and I hope you enjoyed this. And please let me know uh, if there are any questions. I can stop my screen share right now and go back to Derek. Thank you so much uh, for us. That was an amazing presentation, and I think people really enjoyed it, judging by the comments in the chat room. Um, I just wanted to, wanted to add to what Faraz said about his uh, masterclass on mastering light for a wild bird photography. It is uh, coming up next week on the 4th of February um, at the same time as, uh, as this event. And uh, it's, a, it's a paid masterclass, but it's very uh, reasonable. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's priced in South African rands, but it's about $6 US. So I don't think it'll break anybody's bank account to do that. And then um, um, just to say a couple of things about what's happening on Learn the Birds over the next uh, couple of weeks as well. Um, the following week after, after Faraz's uh, masterclass, uh, we're going to Sri Lanka uh, with one of the really top bird guides in Sri Lanka, uh, Taranga Harath. Um, and uh, talking about bird life and birding in Sri Lanka, tropical Indian Ocean Island. So if you've, if you've enjoyed the tropical Caribbean islands, uh, maybe you'll enjoy the tropical um, Indian Ocean Islands as well. And then the following week, we're going to Angola. And the week after that, we'll be in New Zealand. And then uh, March is a very special month on uh, Learn the Birds. We are celebrating women in birding, uh, bird tourism, ornithology, uh, anything to do with birds. And we have some of the best uh, female ornithologists around giving amazing presentations, including one by one of our top uh, scientists on the evolution of birds during the Mesozoic. So keep an eye on what's happening in March. Um, and uh, we have presentations uh, from research ornithologists ranging from South Africa to Portugal to um, Austria. Um, I can't remember all the places now. And um, so I think March is gonna be a really special month. And that's all from me from Learn the Birds. I think we'll take some questions now if people have. I'm just gonna check what's in the, in the chat room. Um, someone says, I have a question. Is there, is the bird trade a big thing there? Yes, I just, I was just checking that question. Hi, Dea. Um, the bird trade and wildlife trade is pretty big in, in Trinidad as well. Of course, it's all illegal. And, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, citizens or parrots and macaws get traded as well as songbirds from coming out of South America. So a lot of seed eaters. I mentioned that a lot of uh, a lot of the birds that sing pretty well, um, people put them in cages, and they fetch a high cost. So um, there, I will send you some more information on that um, as well. I saw uh, regarding um, chocolates and coffees here. Uh, I recommend um, there are a few independent chocolatiers here that uh, some as, let's say, sun eaters. Um, I'll just put them in the chat. 
Um, and there's solar. So you can check a couple of these out. Um, let's see, I'm just um, checking out some of the other other questions. Someone's asking if you lead tours for us. I think two people asked that. Yeah, I, I do lead tours. Um, so you can always reach out to me, uh, check me out on Instagram or even Facebook. And um, if even if I can't do the tour, I have a network of um, very competent guides on both islands that I can always I can always put you on to. So we're very, very um, willing and able to um, to welcome you guys here. And uh, Washington Washira in uh, in Kenya is asking uh, how many days to see the uh, the really special birds that you've highlighted. Oh, hi Washington. Um, I would I would recommend uh, at least a week, so we can do some days on 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 Trinidad and some days on Tobago. It also depends on how how you do your birding as well. So I personally, I, I like to take things slow. So I would recommend personally uh, two weeks. So one week on Trinidad and one week on Tobago. But of course, if you, when, you, when we get to Tobago, the beaches are going to pull you and you're going to want to spend an entire day on the beach and probably disguise it as birding. You'd be like, well, all right, I'm just looking at a, a couple of frigate birds here, but the island vibe is going to want to get to you. And it's, you know, it's going to be, uh, pretty relaxing, I'm sure. So between one week to two weeks, and within a week, let's say if we're building pretty um, diligently, we can easily get uh, 200 to 250 species. And then um, David is uh, asking how active are the, the government in protecting and with con conservation? Well, there are, um, there are several legislations that have been put in place. Um, to protect birds and to protect wildlife um, in general. But um, a, personal, a personal grouse of mine is the extensive uh, open hunting season that we have, which is about five months on, on a tiny island such as this. Um, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but as I'm sure many people would attest in different places, the enforcement, um, a lack of enforcement then would render any legislation useless. So um, of course there is, there is always um, room for improvement. And then Andy Huckabee is asking if uh, we're if we can stream the presentation again at some point. We are putting it on the YouTube channel, aren't we? I actually can't remember whether I asked you or not. <laughs> so I'm putting you on the spot now. Yeah, yeah. Someone was asking me, so maybe we could uh, we could probably make it uh, available. Um, even if it's, even if it's for a limited time. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, so, so the one thing we can do is if, if someone wants to watch it again, uh, perhaps they can just email me, uh, um, on support at learn the birds and I can provide the link. It'll only be there for a week. So yeah. on, on the YouTube channel, on the, not the YouTube channel on the, on the, ah, what's this thing called zoom <laughs> on yeah. the zoom. That's it. I guess we we have to take them down every week because we record to the cloud so it lasts only a week and that might be the best way for now fantastic um okay, so liz was asking about conservation organizations um, um presently we don't have any dedicated conservation organizations to protect birds and biodiversity here so Maybe that is something that I myself might look into in the future to form some organization to really uh, protect birds. But um, I think the best thing that, that, that people can do is to plan a trip here and, um, you know, really to put, uh, to put the, the, the energy into the, the local economy and the, the small tour operators, because these are the guys that really need the um, the help at the at the end of the day. So, um, you know, uh, I forgot where I was going with it, but yeah, the the small guys really need the the, the help um, in terms of um, the economic bailout as well as um, from from a 
a governmental standpoint, the, the authorities are more likely to preserve a piece of forest if they can see some economical value to the forest. So that's what we're trying to do in growing birding tourism in Trinidad and Tobago um, by showing the authorities that there, there's a lot of value in, in preservation of the environment. Uh, Derek, I think you're still muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, somebody's wondering how big the, uh, the does the bat eating bird get? That's from Judy. That's the, the bat falcon. The bat falcon does not get that large. It's, um, I can't remember the exact um, size of it, but I don't think it's, uh, it gets uh, maybe more than 30 centimeters long. So lots of uh, very positive comments and, uh, and thank yous. I'm not sure if we've missed any questions. Um, I'm, I'm sure I missed something because I've been trying to go through the, the, the chat myself, but every time I do something like this, um, I always miss at least one person. So yeah. I, I apologize in advance. I, I'm scrolling up and I'm not seeing anything obvious that we missed. I can't go through all of the uh, the kudos that you're getting, but you're getting a lot of kudos, probably the most I've seen on any of the webinars that we've done. Well, that means a lot. Thank you, everyone. Um, oh, uh, Elizabeth is asking, are there incentives to return land to nature? That is a very, very um, important question. Um, and that's what we're trying to create, Elizabeth, by by encouraging people to visit here for birding and for, you know, to really show the authorities that there is a lot of value in, in the, the, the wild nature um, that we have here. Many people here view uh, the bush as, as just area that is, um, that, that can be developed an area that is calling for development. So, uh, now development is a, a way that people uh, toss around quite often, but it is necessary and, uh, but it's also very necessary to do development well and to do it sustainably. And uh, Jane says your book, question, question. I think you Ooh. need to mention it. I <laughs> I, I uh, completely forgot about that. Yeah, I, I did um, release a book last year called Casual Birding in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is available on, on Amazon, actually. So it's available worldwide. Uh, let me get the link so I can um, put it in the chat right now. And... Yeah, so you all should, should be able to see that. Yeah, so thanks, Jane, for, for reminding me about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to just put the link to your uh, masterclass in the chat as well, as soon as my control C works. Yes, of course. Um, there are there are also several uh, field guides. There are there are two main ones actually. Um, there's one by Richard French, and there's another one by Kenefic and Robin Restall and Floyd Hayes. Um, I have both of them, of course. So this here is the field guide to birds of Trinidad and Tobago um, by Kenefic. Right. Uh, very. This is the the latest one. Um, very handy in the field. And um, this is the one by Richard French, which is um, a little thicker and it has a lot more um, ornithological info in it. So a lot of information about bird nesting and all of that, a lot of observations. And of course, here is my book, right? Uh, Casual Birding in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is quite a sizable book as you would as you would realize. So not really uh, a book to take into the field, um, but a book that you can enjoy. Uh, main difference in my book 
is that there are a lot of a lot of pictures. So while in the field guides you would find a lot of illustrations, I obviously being a photographer, um, stuck in a, a, about a few of my pictures. And by a few, I mean probably around 600 or thereabouts. Okay, I think that's pretty much covered all the questions. And uh, uh, Sandra wants to know what is a small book? <laughs> oh, the small book is the field guide to Birds of Trinidad and Tobago. And you can check this out on Amazon. Just search field guide of Birds of Trinidad and Tobago by Kenefik and Robin Westall. But I think it's all uh, mirrored. So, so thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, for us, and, and thanks everybody for joining us on this very special Learn the Birds uh, webinar. And uh, hopefully, we'll see some of you in the masterclass on light, where you can learn all about uh, using natural light and photographing birds. And thank you again, and uh. Good day, good night, depending on where you are. Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Derek, again. Cool. Bye-bye, everyone. Ciao. Cheers.